Welcome to our video on a couple different things, actually. I guess I'm going to call it uh, intermolecular forces, and we're going to start looking at liquids and solids today. So one of the things that, uh, if we kind of think about where we've been and where we're going, we looked at things, we're, you know, we started with the atom, and then we started looking at bonding two atoms together into ionic and covalent bonding and then the last chapter we did was gases which you know they don't have a regularity to them they're very random and so this chapter now we're going to look at some of the other states of matter liquids and solids and in order to understand that what we have to understand is that in liquids and solids the atoms are close together obviously in a gas that's not true the atoms are very far apart but and that's going to change the way that we look at things. So one of the first things that we need to mention is intermolecular forces. And this is going to very much play into the chapter when we dealt with the shapes and polarities of molecules. So, oops and polarity. So if you need to go back and look that stuff up to remind yourself about that, you probably are going to want to do that in this chapter. So intermolecular forces, commonly referred to as IMFs, is when we are talking about the attractions between molecules. And what those attractions, these are not bonds. These are literally attractions. And it's typically what we're talking about here are, are positive negative attractions. So as you think about polar molecules, for example, it has a positive and a negative end. So just kind of a quick review of the different kinds of molecules that we have. Um, we have in our past talked about molecules that were nonpolar. In other words, they do not have a side, one side or the other that's positive or negative. We talked about polar molecules, and those molecules do have one end that's you know feels a little positive and one end that's negative. And nonpolar, we don't. And then we have highly polar, which is you know we do have a positive and a negative end, but inside of it we have a hydrogen bonded to N or O or F. So we had those distinguishing characteristics to consider. So with this, we have three types of intermolecular forces that you need to be aware of that are going to be affecting solids and liquids um, as we go through. One is called dispersion. Well, you saw these perhaps in your book. One is called dipole-dipole. And the other is hydrogen bonding. And I am going to take that hydrogen bonding, I'm going to put that bonding in parentheses, or quotation marks. It, it is called hydrogen bonding, but it is not a bond. It is still an attraction between molecules, so I want you to keep that in mind. Dispersion. Dispersion is a really weak attraction between molecules. All molecules have this. But not, it's not that important for all molecules. And here, here's what happens. Let's say I have two nonpolar molecules, a hydrogen, one H2 molecule, and another H2 molecule. Well, those electrons are being evenly shared. These are nonpolar molecules. But in those nonpolar molecules, these electrons are not literally staying in one spot. They are moving. They aren't locked into place. And so there may be a moment in time where these two electrons, for example, maybe they just by chance happen to be found more on that side of the molecule. If that's true, that side of the molecule, just for a, whoa, go back, come. Oh boy, everything's losing here. Um, that side of the molecule for a moment feels a little bit negative because those electrons have moved over to that side, leaving this side feeling a little bit positive, sort of random, and it doesn't last. But if that happens, 
this negative attraction actually causes these electrons to be repelled and they move over to this side and this side becomes positive. And what happens is there's actually a really weak attraction between the molecules. That weak attraction is called a dispersion force. All molecules have it because all molecules' electrons are moving and so they might, for example, have this spot where the electrons move over to one side. It doesn't last. It's basically what they call a momentary dipole. And it does cause other ones to form dipoles as well, and so that's where the attraction comes in. But it's momentary, so after a while, that little those electrons move back, probably more towards the middle, and that attraction goes away. So it's a very weak force for that. So that's important to know. And while all molecules have it, for nonpolar molecules, it's the only intermolecular force that they tend to have. Dipole, dipole. As the word di means two, pole is referring to magnetic poles, this is something that's found with polar molecules. And so an example of this would be something like hydrogen chloride. If you check the electronegativity difference, this is a covalent bond between them. But chlorine is more electronegative, and so there is a dipole moment. This side is more negative, this side is more positive all the time because of the way the electrons are being pulled toward chlorine. So if it comes into contact with another hydrogen chloride molecule, who also has its own dipole moment, and this side is negative and this side is positive, there will be an attraction between them, and that attraction is called a dipole-dipole force. In other words, this is a dipole, and this is a dipole, and they're attracted, hence the name dipole-dipole. This one is stronger because it's not a momentary dipole, but it's always there because those two molecules are always attracted to each other. All right, hydrogen bonding. Last one. I like to say that this is an extreme dipole-dipole. It's not what anyone else calls it, but that's really what it is. It's like a really strong version of a dipole-dipole. And it's when we have the highly polar, so a polar molecule where hydrogen is bonded to N or O or F. So for example, and we talked about this in class a little bit, um, water molecules a while ago. Water molecules, here's a water molecule, it's bent. This side is negative because oxygen's more electronegative than the hydrogens. This end of the molecule is positive. So if another water molecule comes in, a negative side of it, it's negative oxygen, will be attracted to the positive end of the other water molecule. And so this bond, not bond, I take that back, <laughs> this attraction is called a hydrogen bond. It's not a bond, but it's a very strong attraction. And it's the reason why hydrogen is important is because hydrogen is so very, very small, it can get really, really close to the next water molecule. And just like you know with magnets, if you get closer, it's stronger. So this then is the strongest intermolecular force because it's got the strongest attraction at least in general, as we'll take a look at later in this unit. All right, the other thing I want to mention to you is because all of those intermolecular forces are related to liquids and solids, which is what this chapter is about. I'm not going to be saying a whole lot about liquids. You'll read about that a little bit in your book, but you know, liquids are a little bit like gases. The molecules have a lot of random movement as the molecules slide past one another. There's no regular shape or anything like that when we look at liquids. However, unlike a gas, those molecules are very close together. So we do have some intermolecular forces that are helping to hold one atom or one molecule to another. But there's no regular pattern. Um, I do want to mention to you at least the different types of solids that we're going to be looking at. So the first one to mention is an ionic solid, 
you are familiar with ionic solids. For example, sodium chloride, good old-fashioned table salt, is an ionic solid. Um, here's another one, calcium carbonate, that's chalk, which you are probably familiar with. And inside of an ionic solid, we have alternating positive and negative ions because they're attracted to each other. And so they form this crystal, they form a crystal, lattice structure, the lattice is formed from the alternating positive and negative ions. So that's one type of solid. Um, we'll number it, number one. Number two, molecular solid. This is obviously a solid made of molecules. So here's some examples you're familiar, familiar with. C12H22O11, good old fashioned sugar. Or say H2O solid, ice. Those are both solids made out of molecules. And as before we move further in that, one of the things we have to consider is that in molecular solids, molecular solids have these intermolecular forces. Ionic solids do not have intermolecular forces because there's no molecules, right? But molecular solids do have intermolecular forces, and those intermolecular forces affect their properties. For example, one of the, the simple things that it could affect are simply what state of matter you're likely to find it in, solid, liquid, or gas. So here's a little diagram. And this first picture is representing dispersion. The second picture, dipole, dipole. And the third picture is representing hydrogen bonding. The SLG stands for states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. Think about this, you guys. Dispersion forces are really, really weak, so the molecules are not, whoa, let's spell that right. The molecules are not held together well. So they're probably not going to hang on to each other very much, which means the vast majority of molecules that have only dispersion tend to be gases because they're not held together very strongly. Fewer of them tend to be liquids, and a tiny amount are solids. For example, carbon dioxide gas. It's nonpolar. It has dispersion. A lot of gases are like that. However, iodine, which is a solid, happens to also be nonpolar. So we can still have solids that have dispersion, it's just there's far fewer of them. Dipole, dipole, similar idea. Lots of dipole, dipoles tend to be liquids, these kind of moderately strong forces. Fewer of them are gases and fewer of them are solids. And in hydrogen bonding, strong bond, holding those molecules together, lots of things with hydrogen bondings are solids, like a lot of sugars taken biology, there's an awful lot of sugars out there. Um, fewer of them are liquids and even fewer things with hydrogen bonding is a gas. Obviously, water has hydrogen bonding and it's a liquid. So yes, they exist, it's just that there's fewer of them. Some of the properties that could be affected by intermolecular forces, boiling point, how easily those molecules can separate from each other, freezing point, how easily those molecules can be attracted to each other. Vapor pressure, how easily something can evaporate. If it can escape easily, it probably is going to have weak forces. Um, and eventually we'll look at solubility. If it's able to dissolve in something else, is very much influenced by intermolecular forces. Okay, another thing that we're taking a look at is your book talks about atomic solid I'm going to kind of lump that together also with network covalent solid. And I'm lumping those two together. I don't, I'm not even sure. I don't have my book in front of me, but um, they may put those in separate categories. But here's what we need to know. In both of these, everything is covalently bonded inside the solid. everything. So there's 
no intermolecular forces because there's not actually any molecules in it. So for example, diamond is something you're familiar with. And in diamond, there's no molecules. Literally, it's all made of carbon, and it happens to be all tetrahedral shaped. But each carbon, then, is tetrahedral shaped to other carbons all the way through the entire diamond crystal. And so there's no molecule. So it's the only thing holding everything together are all of these covalent bonds, which is one of the reasons why diamond is really, really strong. Whereas an ice cube, which has covalent bonds and intermolecular forces, is far less strong. It's easy to break an attraction like an intermolecular force. It's a lot harder to break a bond. And then the last one, a metallic solid. So for example, copper, gold, silver, etc. Take a look at your periodic table. Here's the general idea of how metals work. They're a little different. Let's say this is a piece of copper wire. And let's we'll just we'll, let's just say it's a piece of metal wire. We'll even be just generic about it. Well, what happens is with this metal is the electrons that the valence electrons are what they call delocalized, which is like a fancy word, which means they have no location. So what happens is, let's say we have a metal and it's got two valence electrons. The two valence electrons separate from the metal. And so it forms this little metal ion, and then the electrons sort of separate a little bit throughout the entire piece of metal. So the electrons aren't really attached they're delocalized from the metal throughout that. Well, these electrons then are sort of able to flow around inside of the metal. It's called the electron C model. C because they're able to flow. But it helps to give um, metals some of their properties. For example, the fact that it's able to conduct electricity. Electricity is just the movement of electrons. So if I put an electron in this side, what happens is that electron could go and bump an electron, which will bump another, bump another, bump another, bump another, all the way through until out the other end comes an electron. And that is called conducting electricity. And it's because those electrons are delocalized. In other words, they're loose. That's another way to put it. Uh, these loose electrons can just kind of bump through in a domino effect and come out the other side. So that kind of summarizes some of the solids. We're going to be looking more at intermolecular forces um, and their effect on properties, especially solids, but also some liquids in class. So have a good one.